You can find David Glenn and the David Glenn Show on ncsportsnetwork.com on their YouTube channel as well. DG, as we've discussed throughout the show today, there are several hot-button topics that Jim Phillips likely will have to address on Monday. You and I could be the ones asking the commissioner these questions on Monday. What do you view as the top agenda item in your agenda personally that you will like to hear him address? Yeah, the, the number one item is the future of the ACC. The problem is that there are only so many things that he's going to be able to say, right? We have three different sets of lawsuits playing out in three different states, and he doesn't have a crystal ball when it comes to how those lawsuits are going to unfold or continue to unfold. And it's just one of those questions where it is a worthy question, but you understand when he is going to give some version of the lawyers have asked me not to comment on any specifics or we're going to leave that in the hands of the court system. Uh, they put out the occasional statement on this judicial decision or that judicial decision. But for the most part, Jim Phillips and other ACC executives have avoided public comment except for those carefully crafted statements. So that means that the number one agenda item is going to be mostly dodged in Charlotte next week. Have you heard or seen enough from these court cases to have any read on them? Well, I think the ACC likes how the state of North Carolina lawsuits are unfolding. But I think Clemson likes how the South Carolina-based lawsuit is unfolding. And I think Florida State likes how the the state of Florida lawsuit is unfolding. So, uh, you know, everybody's looking for the home court advantage, a phrase we use in sports a lot, but it applies in the law as well. It shouldn't, but it does. Does that frustrate you? Because no, it's, it's, it's as, asinine. I, I remember being in law school 30 years ago and saying, wait a minute, if the same or similar set of facts are, are unfolding in three different jurisdictions and they all just keep going, Whoever comes to a judicial conclusion first, like that's the result. <laughs> and the answer in our system is basically yes. Uh, you know, I won't get into all the legalese, but essentially nine times out of 10, Josh, judges in two states would defer to the judge usually wherever the first case was filed. And it's because you don't, it's it's not wise for three judges in three states to use up all their court time and all their resources to essentially look at the sim almost the same set of facts. But at least to this point, a judge in Florida insists that his jurisdiction is the right one, and a judge in South Carolina insists that his case is going to go forward. And the judge here in North Carolina, where the first case was filed has said his state is the right place for these cases, for that case to unfold. So it is what it is. There's got to be a better way. And again, nine times out of 10, judges do defer, but it's not a legal requirement that they defer. It's a discretionary thing. And in this case, uh, obviously, Florida State University is a public university in Florida. Clemson is a public university in South Carolina. So those judges who have People to please, those who appointed them, uh, they don't want to give the impression that they're not taking seriously the claims of the in-state public universities. Just like Judge Bledsoe here in North Carolina, the last thing he wants to give the impression of is that he doesn't take seriously these very significant lawsuits that will impact the, the history of a 71-year-old league that was born in North Carolina and is based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and has four members that are based here in North Carolina. So they're all doing what they think is right, I guess, but uh, it's usually done in other ways. And again, you usually defer to the first case filed, but that's not being done by those judges in South Carolina and Florida right now. David Glenn's with us here from the David Glenn Show. It's been about three and a half years of Jim Phillips on the job. As a compliment, I think, Chip Patterson of CBS Sports was here yesterday and said, being honest, Jim Phillips, he probably is the most honest of the commissioners you hear speak. Like, you're not, it doesn't feel like you're being spun all that often 
when Phillips is speaking versus what Brett Yormark was spewing. For example, last week, we're a deeper league without Texas and Oklahoma. Uh-huh. Got it. Yeah. But elevating at a 1,000-foot view of his tenure with the ACC, how would you describe the commissioner that Jim Phillips has been? I think he's been good. I wouldn't say he's been great. But one thing I remind people of is that most of the biggest problems in the Atlantic Coast Conference have nothing to do with Jim Phillips. Those ACC TV deals were signed under John Swafford as the commissioner. And when the grant of rights was filed in 2013 or 2016, this is how college athletics works. The commissioner is different now. Many of the university presidents and chancellors who signed those grants of rights are different now. Many of the athletic directors are different now. He so, did leave Florida State out of the playoff last year. Yeah, the successors are left with the work of their predecessors. Yeah, And so Jim Phillips got some money from our state legislature. He and his team deserve credit for that. That's millions of dollars that they would not have otherwise gotten by giving the impression that they might move to somewhere other than Charlotte, North Carolina, from Greensboro, North Carolina. So give him some credit for that. I know Florida State fans wanted him to be loud and more out front of last year's college football playoff. That could be a legitimate gripe. Um, there, There is a role for showmanship, even among commissioners, right? You do need to be a public advocate for your league. And I do think Jim Phillips does that often. Uh, but we live in a world, Josh, where sometimes people who pound their fists the most or say the most outrageous things somehow gather the most support from often gullible followers. It's not, the, it's, it's show over substance, much of our world right now. And Jim Phillips is a man of substance, much more than he's a man of showmanship. What do you think his biggest achievement is? Is it television distribution? It may be the, it may be the smooth move of the ACC getting $15 million in taxpayer money when we all knew. move is his biggest achievement. Yeah, I mean, we, we all knew where the ACC was most likely to go. Sure. The, the, the NC legislature didn't have to cough up any money, but they went through the process of saying, well, maybe Orlando or maybe here or maybe there when we all knew it was going to happen, but you got $15 million that you didn't otherwise have. Uh, a crowning achievement for Jim Phillips would be nurturing a relationship with ESPN, which has some sort of contract. We don't have access to the TV deal, so we don't know the exact way to describe this option. But ESPN has to tell the ACC by February 2025, which is only six-ish months away, whether they're going to exercise the final nine years of that incredibly lengthy TV deal with the ACC. If Jim Phillips navigates that well, he has done a great job as a commissioner. If ESPN announces that they're opting out, they don't opt out right in February 2025, but that's when they have to say they're opting out of, of the, the post-2027 years of that deal. Then Jim Phillips' job would be to either renegotiate a new deal with ESPN, which would be very difficult because if ESPN opts out of the regular of the existing deal, that wreaks havoc on the grant of rights and realignment and everything else. You just lost Florida State and Clemson, if that's the case. Yeah, his his biggest tasks are in front of him. There, there's not he doesn't have a magic wand. A anybody who blames Jim Phillips for the ACC's financial issues, rather than the fact that the ACC just has never had the types and millions of college football TV viewers in the same bulk, in the same frequency as the SEC or the Big Ten. Anybody who doesn't use those disparities as the starting point for understanding the financial gap does not know what they're talking about, period. It starts with football TV audiences. And you and I have covered the ACC for most of our lives. It has been far more often the better basketball league with the biggest basketball TV audiences. It has rarely been the best football league with the biggest football audiences. And that's over 70 plus years through all different types of commissioners. So J Jim Phillips, there are fair criticisms of him 
But anybody pointing the finger at him for this financial gap simply doesn't know what they're talking about. I agree with that. David Glenn's with us here. But the negative, the flip side, probably the thing that he's, you know, the biggest knock on him the last three and a half years will be lack of foresight when it comes to being one of the, you know, chess, uh, one of the chess masters of the, of the alliance that fell apart and how you not being forward thinking about where things were going with the playoff and how that was pushed off. And perhaps when USC and UCLA were had in 21, not being forward thinking to see westward expansions where you need to go add Oregon and Washington who are more valuable football properties than the teams you ended up getting being the last ones at the dish, so to speak. That's a fair question. We will never know how Oregon and Washington would have reacted. Because remember, there was a time in the AC's history, ACC's history prior to Jim Phillips where they unofficially asked the University of Texas, which was always publicly frustrated by the Big 12. We, we heard that from the Longhorns for a long, long time. And a lot in the Big 12 disliked the Longhorns in part because they had their own Longhorn network and the, the Big 12, some of the members thought the Longhorns were holier than thou and all that stuff. Well, the ACC did reach out. And you know what happens when the Longhorns receive that? They start contemplating, well, if we were ever to leave the Big 12, where, we would, where would we go? Well, now we know. It, it's the SEC. We don't know that even if Jim Phillips had had the foresight and the more aggressive stance that you just described, reach out to Washington and Oregon, which are more desirable – college football properties by a lot than what the ACC ended up with, with Cal and Stanford and SMU, obviously. We don't know. It's The executives at those universities certainly know and knew years ago that the most lucrative places to land were the Big Ten and the SEC, period. So even if Jim Phillips had gotten their attention, I'm skeptical that that means the ACC would have been able to add the Ducks and, and Washington because they definitely would have looked around at the landscape. And that's when leagues that might not have extended offers say we better offer or that the ACC is going to get these guys. I agree. And I think, I think ultimately how it shook out was going to be how it shook out, but it is different than having not having the foresight at all and it not is. at least making that call. We do know that it was that year at ACC kickoff that Jim Phillips went down the gated community path and that being best for college football. And that suggests that he wasn't looking at Westford expansion. I, I want to close with this. DG's with us here, David Glenn. Here's what's happened for me the last 10 days. We announced last week, Sarah Bradford and I are expecting. You don't know this, or I guess now you do, but SB and I got under contract for a new house this week. Ooh. And this week is the six year anniversary of our show's launch. So during a time where people say it's a slow time on the calendar, <laughs> can't relate, my friend. <laughs> Well, congratulations to you on multiple levels there and to Sarah Bradford, of course. Uh, I'm excited about all three of those things. Um, and being a friend of yours, of course, I'm, I'm most excited about you becoming a dad. It's one of the greatest blessings uh, and one of the greatest responsibilities of my life. And I love it to this day now that I'm 25 years into fatherhood. Uh, but buying a house is a big deal. And being in your industry, I know how difficult it is to do what you have done during your time in the triad and as a voice of sports around this state. So I really congratulate you on that. Uh, in, in a sense, anybody can have a baby, <laughs> but not anybody can be on the air for as long as you have as a great voice of reasoning, voice of sports in the triad, which, as you know, uh, has been a Bermuda Triangle for sports radio at times in my lifetime. So credit to you for pulling off. I love that. I love the uh, league of their own line. The hard is what makes it great. And <laughs> the hard is what makes your accomplishment great in the case of your uh, extended tenure there in the triad. Let's close with that because your advice, I remember it. It stuck out when I took the job in 2018. Hey, by the way, no one's lasted more than two years there. It's kind of a weird thing. We don't quite know why. Ed Harden gives me the advice. You want to know what to do? How about talk about the Panthers and talk about the Tar Heels who are right down the road, even though they're not technically in the Piedmont triad. And that's kind of worked out for us uh, since it is the six year anniversary of the show. What do you remember at that time about the show launching and the mystery of sports talk in this area as somebody 
who has been on the air here for a very long time and, you know, has unique perspective as a result. I remember considering the Bermuda Triangle reference that I just used because I know a lot of sports fans in the triad. And it is one of the more populous parts of our state beyond the Charlotte area and the Triangle, obviously. So there was no real functional reason that it couldn't happen uh, for an extended period. Uh, but the other thought is, having known you since you were basically born into this industry as someone who once worked for me as an intern, I knew it was going to take somebody special to be based in the triad, talk about things that people care about in the triad. But also, you don't tie yourself with a chain to your desk there next to WD. I see you busting your tail and you are all over this state in person and coaches see your face and athletes see your face. It is not easy. I think nine out of 10 sports fans, and I'm not saying they should know these things, but nine out of 10 people who appreciate our final product don't know what goes into making that final product. And in your case, among others, there is a ridiculous amount of hard work, FaceTime, legwork, research, professionalism, preparation, and just good old fashioned nose to the grindstones type type stuff. I mean, it's the 21st century and there are new things that you need to do. But some of the things you do well would have applied 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago in terms of being successful in other contexts. So I admire you for that. I respect you for that. And, and I'm really excited for your success in all of these area you, areas. You have earned it, my friend. Monday, thank you so much for that. That's just incredible and means the world coming from you. Uh, Monday through Thursday, we're going to be doing our show from ACC kickoff. And I look forward to seeing you there. Um, well, we'll see you can ask the, the better question in the press conference on Monday. I don't know. Deal. We'll, we'll figure it out. DG, thanks for the time. David Glenn Show. Make sure you find the Pineys as DG is uh, handing out awards, the best things that we've seen in sports in the state of North Carolina. That's a, a great thing that you can find at ncsportsnetwork.com and on the David Glenn Show. DG, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Josh. WD, keep up the good work, guys.